I'm Dr. Dean Ornish, and uh, my friend uh, Dr. John McDougall asked me to make a few comments, and I'm a great admirer of his work, so I was happy to do so. Uh, you know, I used to think if we just did good science, that would change medical practice, and to some degree it did, but not nearly to the degree that I really thought it would. And what I learned is that it's not enough to have good science, one has to have reimbursement as well. And after 16 years, uh, Medicare is now paying for our program, and now that Medicare is paying for it, many others are as well. And so although it's been a real long process, almost four decades of doing this with, for both uh, John and me, I really do think that our time is now. Uh, there's a convergence of forces that make this the right idea at the right time. And it's very easy to get discouraged, and sometimes it's three steps forward and one or two steps back. But the overall arc of this trajectory is in a, is in a positive way, it's in a healing way. And here's what I mean. Um, we're creating a new paradigm of healthcare because Medicare is now paying for it. And they're paying for it at an ever-increasing levels, which make it financially sustainable and interesting for doctors to do this. At the same time that the limitations of high-tech approaches are becoming increasingly well documented. I mean, for example, the meta-analysis of angioplasty and stents in the Archives of Internal Medicine that looked at the eight randomized trials of stents and angioplasties found that they all show that they don't work. That unless you're in the middle of having a heart attack, they don't prolong life, they don't produce angina, they don't prevent heart attacks, and yet we spent uh, you know, almost $80 billion on stents and angioplasties and bypasses that are dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. The same for prostate cancer. One out of 49 men in the New England Journal of Medicine who had early stage prostate cancer benefited from the surgery or the radiation. The other 48 often ended up impotent or incontinent at both, or both. You know, huge personal um, you know, side effects. You're wearing diapers, you can't have sex for no benefit at huge economic costs. And type 2 diabetes already affects a third of Americans, or, or pre-diabetes, and in, in the next six years it's estimated to affect half of Americans at a cost of over $3.3 trillion, clearly not sustainable. And yet the studies that show that lowering your blood sugar with drugs don't work nearly as well as getting it down with lifestyle. If you can get your blood sugar down, your hemoglobin A1C down below 7 with just diet and lifestyle, as both John and I have shown over and over again, you can prevent all the human costs and all the economic costs. The human costs of diabetes or you know, heart attacks, impotence, amputations, blindness, kidney failure, on and on and on. And yet if you get your hemoglobin A1C down through diet and lifestyle, as we have shown and, and Dr. McDougall has shown over and over again, you can prevent each and every one of them. At a time that the limitations of drugs and surgery for the most common conditions has become increasingly well documented, the power of these simple changes in diet and lifestyle is also becoming increasingly well documented. Lifestyle not only is prevention, but is treatment. This emerging field of lifestyle medicine, I think our time finally is now. And now that with the advent of Obamacare, whatever one thinks about it, it's turning all the incentives on their ear. You know, before in a traditional fee-for-service environment, the more stents, the more angioplasties, the more bypasses, or any kind of medical procedure you do as a doctor or hospital, the more reimbursement you get. Now it's more, here's X amount of dollars to take care of someone. You, the doctor, the hospital, or the clinic gets to keep what's left over. So the fewer operations you do, the more, more, the more money you get. And now that Medicare and other insurance companies are paying for lifestyle interventions like ours, there's a double benefit. There's the payment on the front end and the participation and savings on the back end. Now, at the same time, we're seeing all these great things happening. There's been a resurgence of research on low-carb diets, and I think part of that is telling people what they want to hear, you know, telling people that bacon and pork rinds and sausage and, you know, red meat are good for you is a great way to sell magazines or books or, or whatever, but it's not true. You know, I'd love to be able to tell people that, but it's, it's, not, it's not so. Now, there is a kernel of truth in there, and I think that's something that we can all learn from. There is a difference between sugar and white flour and white rice and so on and, you know, whole foods in terms of brown rice and whole grains and so-called good carbs. And so I think to the degree that we can focus on reducing our intake of refined carbs like sugar and emphasize good carbs like fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and soy products, I think we're in agreement about that. But the difference is, you know, the, the low-carb people will say that all carbs are bad and you should end up eating uh, you know, more, more red meat, and yet at, at a time when studies have shown that it's not just the protein versus the carbs, but there was a meta-analysis that was done by the people at Harvard, the Physicians Health Study, the Nurses Health Study, they showed that red meat consumption was, cons was uh, uh, associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality, 
cardiovascular mortality, and all cancer mortality. And just a few months ago, last March, there was an article that came out that's showing it's not just protein versus carbs, but the, I mean, uh, fat versus carbs, but the protein itself, if it's from animal origin, that people that a lot of eating, eating a lot of animal protein, but not plant protein, that those eating a lot of animal protein had a 75% increased risk of premature death from all causes, a 400% increased risk from all forms of cancer, and a 500% increased risk of diabetes. And so I think we need to get away from this low fat versus low carb and say, what is a healthy way of eating? And it's essentially a whole foods, plant-based diet based predominantly on fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and soy products. High in the good carbs, lower in the refined carbs. And also, it's not just diet, but the stress management techniques, things simple like yoga and meditation, moderate exercise like walking, and perhaps most important, uh, love and support, spending more time with your friends and families and loved ones. You know, it's, it, it's surprising to me the level of science in these journal articles that get published on low-carb diets is really uh, substandard. The one that came out uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine from uh, Tulane earlier this week. You know, they asked people to go from a 35% fat diet to a 30% fat diet. That's hardly any reduction in fat at all. And that's the diet that the control groups, the comparison groups of our studies were. When we were comparing a, a whole foods plant-based diet to something, that's what we were comparing it to. Those people got worse. The people who made bigger changes got better. You know, at the same time, the people on a so-called low-carb diet were making significant reductions in low carbs to the point that they were eating several hundred more, several hundred fewer calories a day. And yet, it just ends up, the headline says, oh, low-carb is better than low-fat. Perhaps most importantly, those studies on low-carb don't measure what's actually happening in your arteries. And that's so important because the studies have shown that um, when you go on a low-carb diet, those ones that have actually looked at the arteries, that the blockages increase in the arteries, even if it's not reflected in an increase in LDL or triglycerides or HDL or other factors. It's mediated through what are called non-traditional risk factors, like endothelial progenitor cells, which are little white blood monocytes that are like Pac-Man that chew up the blockages and help to get rid of it in the arteries, or increases in inflammation. And so, you know, risk factors are not diseases. And uh, when you actually look at the underlying arteries, what, you all, what we found is that on a whole foods plant-based diet, they reverse. Even severely blocked arteries become measurably less clogged. Whereas on a high protein, low carb diet, they get more clogged, even if it's not reflected in the changes in the risk factors. And so John has been a leading light in all of this. He's been really courageous in not being afraid to speak the truth. Um, and I think that finally, after many decades that we've both been doing this, our time has finally come. The truth will come out. It always does. And while it's easy to get discouraged, you know, that's part of what makes it meaningful. It's really hard doing this work. But I, for one, and I know John as well, uh, are so passionate about doing this work because we've spent decades working with real people, seeing their heart disease getting better, seeing their chest pain go away, getting them off medications they were told they'd have to take for the rest of their lives, and, and helping them use the experience of the suffering that comes with being diagnosed with a potentially life-threatening illness as a doorway or as a catalyst for transforming their lives for the better to such a degree that we've both heard the same thing over and over. People say things like, you know, maybe having a heart attack or being diagnosed with diabetes or, or prostate cancer was the best thing that ever happened. You go, what are you, crazy? And they say, no, that's what it took to get my attention that got me to hear what you're saying that's ultimately made the quality of my life so much better that I might not have gotten interested in on that otherwise. And that's where this website that John has and the books he's written and the things that we're doing you know, can be resources and hopefully reaching people at an earlier stage where they don't have to wait for something bad to happen before they begin to see what's really true. So I, I hope this has been useful and uh, I congratulate you for the steps that you're taking. Thank you.